Okay, welcome back. We are on to, uh, where are we at, 9.37, bylaw number 1877. Yep, the red light's on. So administration is seeking approval for roadway license bylaw number 1877, authorizing the MD of Bonneville into an agreement to license a portion of the road allowance north of the north half of 36, 58 of 8, in accordance with policy 3A.018, as shown on the map on Appendix A. The applicants have applied to license the road allowance to be used as agricultural use for grazing of cattle. A copy of this application was provided to Infrastructure Services and Agricultural Services for review and recommendation, and there were no concerns. The applicant currently has an existing roadway licensing agreement under Bylaw 1852 for the east portion that's shown on that Appendix A. So if Bylaw 1877 is approved, this bylaw would repeal that bylaw, and we would put both portions onto one bylaw. So administration is recommending that council give first reading to Bylaw 1877. Mr. Reeve, I'll do first reading. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Kraviak, for making this motion that bylaw number 1877, being the bylaw of the Municipal District of Bonneville, number 87, roadways license, be given first reading. Any discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. That's carried. Thank you. On to 9.3.8. So administration received a written request to purchase the northeast of 8, 60 of 4, west of the 4th Meridian, which is located just east of Muriel Lake, uh, shown on Appendix C, it is owned by the MD. The sale of the northeast of 8, 60 of 4 would fall under policy C-3A.019, disposal of municipal lands. The lands are currently being used for agricultural purposes through a municipal lands licensing agreement which expires December 31st of 2026. It has the option to extend the licensing agreement for one additional three-year term. Information regarding the northeast of eight, 60 of four. The parcel size is 159.02 acres. It has a soil productivity rating of seven. The minimum annual licensing amount for as per the policy of licensing is $3 per acre, which is what is currently being licensed out at, which totals into about $500.91 a year. Municipal taxes paid by the licensee in 2023 was $44.92. There also is a surface lease with Gear Energy Limited on the parcel, and the leasee does pay $3,060 to the MD annually. The fair market value is estimated on this parcel at $200,000. So internal referrals were conducted and the following comments were received. <coughs> Infrastructure services would be interested in completing gravel exploration on the property before giving a final decision on whether or not there is any interest in the land. So pursuant to policy C-3A.019, C the Disposable Municipal Lands Policy, which is attached as Appendix D, all lands subject to this policy could be sold by these ways. So the first is a direct sale at fair market value. That being said, it would need to be advertised in accordance with the MD public notification bylaw for a period of two consecutive weeks. If multiple offers were received after the public notification timeline, the lands would then be sold by public auction. Or it could go straight to public auction. Um, and with the public auction, each parcel shall be subject to a reserve bid of 80% of the estimated market value. So administration's recommendation is that the request to purchase the MD titled lands, the northeast of eight, 60 of four, at fair market value be referred back to administration for additional information regarding gravel exploration and to bring back to a future meeting of council. Okay, thank you. Someone would like to make a motion? Sure, yeah, I'll make the motion that we bring it back to a future meeting. Okay, thank you. Deputy Reeve Crick for making this motion that council refers request to purchase the MD title land <coughs> northeast 864 west of the 4th Meridian as a fair market value back to administration for additional information regarding gravel exploration and bring back to a future meeting of council. Any discussion on this motion? Seeing that I'll call for the vote. <coughs> Thank you.
That's current. On to 9.3.9. So uh, Planning and Community Service Department uh, is presenting their quarterly reports. Um, and I'm going to start uh, with Appendix A, which is for Planning and Development. So on the first page, at a glance, um, in the second quarter, we issued 117 development permits, 63 building permits. We had two new subdivision applications. We processed 51 realtor reports. Um, calls received at our, pl our planning and development reception only uh, were 2,057, that's what we received. 13 housing starts. We had 163 safety codes permits. 288 inspection reports, 100 address signs were ordered, and we sent out 34 satisfaction surveys. So for development permits, you can see that we had permits across all wards, one through six, with the tops wards being one, five, and six with the most development. Um, 117 permits were issued with the average time to issue for a permitted use permit, it took three days. For an approach permit, it takes 23 days to issue that permit, and discretionary use permits were averaged at 27 days. So for building permits, there was 63 building permits issued. The majority of them, 53 of them, were residential. Uh, average time to issue a building permit was 15 days in the second quarter, with a total construction value of just over $16.9 million. We had two new applications received and an average of 40 days to approval for applications and five applications endorsed in the second quarter. So out of the 163 safety code permits issued, we had 72 electrical, 18 plumbing, 50 gas, and 23 septic permits, with a total of 288 inspection reports received back from our inspectors. The average time to issue these permits, electrical, plumbing, and gas are issued in the same day, Septic permits take a couple days because there is a review, so our septic permits took an average of three days. Some quick updates. Uh, realtor reports, 51 completed with a turnaround time of 2.5 days. We had 100 address signs ordered, 92 have been picked up, and the turnaround time for ordering those signs is two weeks. We had no new non-compliances reported to us, but we did resolve nine new non-compliances non uh, with issuances of development and building permits. So the Marie Lake Forestry, the subdivision, the forestry lands, uh, a meeting was held with the Minister of Forestry of Parks on June 19th of 2024 to try and expedite the MD's acquisition of the lands. Um, however, there is no new updates at this time, but we are hoping for something speedy to happen there. Satisfaction surveys, 34 surveys were sent out. Um, four were received back from us. They were all satisfied, two very satisfied. Some updates on our area structure plans. So the Moose Lake and Chicken Hill ASP uh, both received first reading on June 11th. The public hearing was held on July 9th and it just got finalized uh, earlier today with second and third readings. And the Crane Lake and Highway 55 area structure plans. Survey results were received um, and a community engagement summary was prepared for each of the ASPs to be posted on the municipal website as well as mailed to stakeholders and landowners within the area structure plan boundaries. So those dra draft ASPs did receive uh, first reading also earlier in this meeting. A couple more project updates. The municipal lands bylaw education so site inspections were completed to determine signage necessary and locations of the 2024 priority areas. So we will be signing um, and actually sending out pamphlets to the Birch Ridge Estates, Whispering Spruce, as well as Ethel Lake subdivisions. So mail, mail outs were being created for education in conjunction with upcoming sign installation to be completed in Q3. Our land use bylaw, so open houses were held the beginning of May of 2024 to introduce the project to the landowners, stakeholders, and community members. An online survey was also available from May 17th to June 21st for community members to provide their feedback. So we did have a what we heard report for feedback was received, it was drafted and posted on the municipal website as well as an article um, in the August Rural Review. Is there any questions? Right. Me? <laughs> you got me again for asset management. 
So just a quick update from asset management, uh, the state of the infrastructure reports, so for parks and recreation is on hold at the moment, as well as asset register and data collection is on hold. Um, GIS at a glance, uh, our GIS technician completed uh, five maps within this quarter, four, four, four form surveys and quick captures, as well as four other completed projects. Some ongoing projects, most notable, the 2024 MD land ownership map is 100% complete. Waste services interactive map is at 40%. The road inventory data reconciliation in GIS is at 75%. And emergency and protective services response maps are sitting at 50%. Yeah, I think Mr. Kovach is up next. Thank you. Good afternoon, Reven Council. It's my pleasure this afternoon to present the second quarter progress report for economic development. Good afternoon. You will see in front of you that um, for the second quarter attended 13 meetings, worked on two lead generations, uh, started work on two projects, um, had 12 uh, new registrants for the business registry program, did eight business visits, and attended uh, three conferences or trade shows. Uh, referring to the business and industry growth strategy from an investment readiness perspective, uh, the uh, registry program is ongoing, the web design is completed, the business, uh, business visitation program uh, continues with a full report uh, to be presented in Q3 as it'll have been a full year for the program. Uh, we've completed our value proposition for the website. From an investment attraction perspective, we applied for and received the NRED grant, which is ongoing, which contains an industrial uh, commercial gap analysis project, which has kicked off. We have uh, been approved for an airport development impact assessment, and we're also in um, underway with the planning and delivery of the site link forum, which I'll, I'll provide a, a much uh, further uh, update uh, later in the report. Um, the uh, ACP commercial industrial property listings was a grant that we applied for uh, in conjunction with uh, hub members that's ongoing. Business attraction and retention programs is ongoing. We have uh, completed a community profile that's been posted to the new website and we're in, um, uh, we're part of a project for an unmanned aerial vehicle uh, grant through SCOP, which is uh, through the provincial government, and that's in conjunction with other hub members as well. From an economic development uh, diversification perspective, a regional collaboration is ongoing as we continue to work with REAP and HUB on several projects, uh, continue to identify shovel-ready projects, and continue to work with Invest Alberta and Invest Canada. And over the second quarter, we replied to two project uh, proposals or lead generations. One was Project Clay, which has been submitted, and Project Lightning, which has been submitted. Project Clay is uh, Eco Cosmetics, and the Project Lightning is a data center. From a brand development perspective, we continue to work with the communications department on ongoing materials. We continue to uh, work on the MD Champion Ambassador Program. A policy is pending uh, for being presented for approval. And um, we continue to deliver on our economic development newsletter. The second quarter um, edition has been complete and been distributed. <coughs> uh, stakeholder meetings include uh, those with uh, realtors and brokers in the region. Community Futures, Invest Alberta, Invest Canada, Alberta Agriculture and Irrigation, Portage College, the Economic Developers of Alberta, Connect for Food, Alberta Hub, uh, Bonneville and District Chamber of Commerce, uh, North Alberta, Northern Alberta Development Council, iArt or iMarket, uh, Pathways Alliance, and uh, Labor, Marker Par Labor Market Partnership. Project updates. Um, the coordination of uh, Webster Global with regards to SiteLink, uh, the launch of an online registration uh, portal for SiteLink, uh, events uh, and attraction, or sorry, uh, monthly event and committee meetings, uh, which uh, a council representative attends on a regular basis, uh, identifying pro 
uh, uh, program speakers and special guests have been confirmed. Social media campaign has been started and tour sites have been confirmed. And if you'll indulge me, uh, I will provide some, some greater details on SiteLink. It'll just take a few moments. Uh, SiteLink is on the near horizon. The event has two components. One is education and one is an industrial tour. The educational component is an opportunity for local economic development professionals, elected officials, real estate developers, and others to receive tips on best practices on investment attraction from various sectors um, and re representing uh, major manufacturers and commercial interests from across the globe. The educational component will take place September 18th to 20th at uh, Cold Lake Best Western. And I strongly urge all of council to attend and, and my, um, I, I think I've, I've heard back from probably 75% of council that it will be attending. So thank you very much for that. Um, so this, this particular event um, has uh, site selectors that are representative of the different industry sectors that we targeted in the business and industry growth strategy. Paige Webster is uh, the lead presenter and he has uh, experience in aeros aerospace, biotech, geothermal, wind solar, warehouse distribution, office projects, and, and the retail sector. Uh, while working um, in uh, Arizona, he was also involved in um, value-added agriculture and uh, plastic molding. Uh, Jamie Newell is also a consultant broker and she brings with her uh, 20 years of experience. What's important about Jamie is that she has relationships with companies like Toyota and Toyo and um, Industrial Tech Services, APN Investments, uh, Slumber Shield, um, Scotland, um, uh, companies in Scotland, Blue Pack Marketing, Forge Investment. So she brings with her a, 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 a stable of clients that um, could be interested in our community uh, from across the globe. Uh, Lou Mellencamp is an individual who will um, be there as well. He has uh, experience in um, site selection for healthcare services, financial services, aerospace and manufacturing, as well as education, hospitality and technology. Uh, Grant uh, Kelba is an individual from Calgary who is uh, involved not only in real estate, but it's also involved in, in tourism development. He was responsible for the development of the mascot for the Calgary Flames and as a result of being involved with the Calgary Flames and the Calgary Olympics, he was uh, a developer of a tourism product for an online booking service called Resort to Fitness, um, which was one of the first 500 domains in Canada that was, was registered uh, for uh, and was involved with uh, tourism booking for special events and was directly involved in uh, the Paraplegic Association. Christine Wong will also be there. She's a veteran um, of site selection and she's worked in economic development in, uh, in areas uh, including uh, meat processing and uh, healthcare systems and other uh, medical attraction and as well as uh, developing programs in, in different uh, states and involving uh, development attraction that she generated over $1.8 billion worth of capital investment creating over $5,000 uh, or 5,000 jobs. <coughs> These individuals represent a significant opportunity for us to connect not only us as a, a government but to connect to uh, local uh, realtors, developers and contractors and create those uh, opportunities to um, uh, have access to investment opportunities that normally wouldn't uh, uh, directly be uh, given to us without this relationship. So um, I'll go over the opportunities for counselors to attend these events, to be involved in networking and create those relationships. So on Wednesday evening, which would be September the 18th, there'll be a stand-up uh, reception at Portage College from five to seven. There'll be a invitation only exclusive uh, sponsorship barbecue dinner at the Shaw House and that'll be from 7 to 10 p.m. And I strongly suggest that all of you attend as um, our CAO, Al Hogan, will be doing the barbecuing for us. So he'll be cooking our steaks and, and our hamburgers. Um, and my understanding is that he's, he's, he's exceptional at that. So, so take sure out life, life insurance, you're saying, yeah, for exactly. this event? <laughs> I maybe shouldn't okay. have commented on that last part, but yeah, for sure. Um, so that's, uh, that's Wednesday. Uh, for, uh, for Friday, there's uh, an opportunity 
at, uh, at 1.30 to 3 o'clock in the Maple Room for a discovery session. And this session will provide an opportunity for the site selectors to talk directly to the councillors and to senior administration and, and talk about those um, uh, situations and answer questions that the site selectors uh, will have for us in order for us to develop that relationship. And on, on that, to that end, we have created a uh, list of top 10 questions we believe that the site selectors will be asking you and we will have provided um, common answers for all of you to respond to the site selectors. So that's another important event for them to uh, to get to know us, to get to know our, our administration and to get to know what's available in our community and develop those relationships. After that uh, discovery opportunity which is a, a basically uh, a one-on-one -on -one with the site selectors. Um, there'll be an opportunity to do a tour of CFB Cold Lake between 3.30 and 4.30 on that Friday afternoon. And the, the piece de resistance, as far as I'm concerned, is the industrial tour, which takes place on September the, the 21st, and that's an opportunity, again, for council and senior administration and select business individuals, including re, re, uh, realtors, uh, brokers, and contractors, to tour our area. We'll start at the Cold Lake Best Western, we'll pass by the college, and then we'll tour all of the, um, the industrial subdivisions in the MD. We'll have a site visit at uh, Nabi 8. Uh, we'll end up having lunch at the uh, Willow Prairie Hall. Then we'll uh, have a presentation at the airport. We'll visit more subdivisions. Then we'll make our way to the um, uh, Kinnisu and have a white table dinner with the site selectors and uh, send them off. So my strong uh, recommendation is that you are all involved in the industrial tour on Saturday, and as many of you can <coughs> attend, please, to the discovery session between 1.30 and 3 on Friday at the Cold Lake Best Western and the Shaw House exclusive sponsorship dinner on Wednesday night between 7 and 10. Any Thank questions? You. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, uh, Councillor Fideo. I'm assuming, uh, or Friendly local reporters are going to be there as well. Uh, yeah, um, so we we haven't uh, we haven't issued uh, any media releases at this point uh, for the tour specifically. We have issued uh, media releases about the event. Um, as far as them being on the tour, uh, seating is limited, and I apologize, I can't confirm that a seat is available for press, but that's a, a media, and so I think that's a very good idea, and I'll make sure that that's looked at as soon as possible. Okay, thank you. Well, I'll stand if, if she's included. Okay. <laughs> I think I have my marching orders on this one. <laughs> right on. Thank you. No other questions? Uh, yeah, great presentation. job. Thank you. Good presentation. Thank you. Lisa, too. Good afternoon, Council. Good afternoon. Here for the Parks and Rec uh, 2024 second quarter progress report. Starting off with a few of the highlights. Uh, Parks and Recreation kickoff with our uh, new seasonal operation team model. We had over 50, uh, 50 plus staff members. Uh, we're at that barbecue plus a few invitees as well. Um, April 1st was the opening day of our campsite bookings. We ended up having 667 total bookings that day. That was 4,889 nights that were booked, which was a total revenue of 197,000 plus dollars in revenue. Uh, a few of our project updates. The VIC retrofit, building retrofit, is sitting right now at about 80%. Uh, we're still looking for some uh, inter, uh, interpretive displays, things like that. Uh, Vezo Beach phase two, 90% complete on that one. We are still looking at finishing off the fencing around the, uh, the campground itself. Lori, uh, LaCorie Rec Park Development, that's 100% complete now. The Cold Lake MD Park Boat Launch uh, has been awarded to a, a local contractor. We're hoping to start construction on that one September 23rd, as soon as the campground is closed when we're counting on all in water work to be done by the end of November, November 30th. Chicken Hill Boat Dock uh, at the campground, that one is 100% complete and is in operation. People have been using it. The Cold Lake Picnic Shelter, we're going to be replacing the Cold Lake Picnic Shelter. That's up there right now. We're at 10%. We're just into the design phase of that right now. Hopefully we get that back here by the end of the month and we can go ahead with that for construction this fall. 
uh, early spring. The Bonneville Wellness Collision uh, Vezo Beach space, we're 50% complete on that. We have the tables ordered up. We're going to be installing some tables here next week on that one as well. And one of our projects, the Cold Lake Shower Building that went out uh, during the second quarter was the, uh, well, the Cold Lake Shower Building. Uh, we ended up getting one bid back on that one. It was a little over budget and the criteria or the design that they provided us was a little bit lacking, so we are right now on hold with that one. And we'll see in, a, in the new capital budget that's coming up uh, some changes on that one. Uh, ongoing playground inspection program that we have, we are uh, continuing with the monthly inspections. We have 17 playgrounds that we inspect monthly. Um, annually, we've done in-depth inspections of 15 of our playgrounds. That's where we end up having a 10, 10 to 12 page report on those ones. Uh, our com com yeah, commemorative bench program. Uh, we have two benches that we have purchased. This is with the Bonneville Wellness Coalition for the Vezo Beach area that we've uh, provided. Our baseball diamonds, Muriel Lake and Fort Kent. Uh, by the end of May to mid-August, we are uh, booked six nights a week. We're constantly down there each and every day doing our, our general maintenance, our chalking lines, and doing the maintenance of the uh, ball diamonds for our users. Our picnic table rental program, we've donated to four different events. We've had five internal events. We've rented out to two events. Uh, jump right down to the trail usage. If we look at the trail usage compared to last year, these are our paved trails that are all around our uh, Moose Lake, uh, our Ardmore uh, stormwater pond that's in Ardmore and our trails down at Muriel Lake. They have been down a little bit this year, uh, still being used, but they are down uh, pretty much across the board with all of them by around 10% in usage. Our campground bookings, revenue by campground. Uh, we have a chart there for that one as well. Our Cold Lake being our busiest Cold Lake, or being our busiest campground. And, uh, and our largest campground. As you can expect, it is our, uh, our largest revenue gain at 43.8%. Uh, next in line to that one would be the Vezo Beach at 18.9%. Uh, Crane Lake would come in third at 12.8%. Uh, and the remaining of them are all sitting at around the 2.9 2 to Wolf Lake, 7.2%, again, based on the size of the campground and the number of sites, revenue would be uh, a little bit on the, on the higher end. Our parks and recreation security, uh, we have security patrols going around all of our campgrounds, our baseball fields, and our outdoor rinks each night, uh, so it's seven nights a week. They've addressed several concerns, such as uh, a lot of noise complaints, drinking on public land that's on the beaches, uh, vandalism, uh, ATV uh, driving in some of our campgrounds that are in prohibited areas. Uh, there's several different uh, items that they've addressed. Dropping down into the OHV Pelican Point program, we've had a few campers, not as many as we would like to see, um, take advantage of the new, new pilot project that we have going on out there. Um, right now we're working with marketing on strategies to increase the numbers of the OHV use that are in that area. Uh, so you'll see that coming ahead soon. Campground bookings. Up to June the 30th, being the second quarter, uh, our numbers have increased across the board. We have two campgrounds that are a little, little under. Uh, Pelican Point, we're down nine, nine bookings compared to last year. Crane Lake, we're down 42 bookings compared to last year. But in total, if we look at all the campgrounds, uh, we have 4,240 bookings. And compare that to last year's, that was 3,769. We have a 471 booking increase this year. Our camping fees is also an increase of approximately $40,000. We have uh, currently up to date uh, $242,183 in revenue or fees. Our shower is also increased by uh, $11,000, uh, or not 11000 1.1,000. 1. 1, uh, it was $1,401 last, or this year, last year was at $313, so we've uh, increased by 1000
$1,100. Our firewood sales uh, have increased quite a bit here. Uh, this year we're at $15,290 on our firewood sales. Last year in quarter two, we're at $4,455. That's an increase of $11,000 just in the firewood sales. Our rate your stays from all of our campers, we ended up having 38 people reply back saying exceptional. We have uh, 14 saying good. And as of the second quarter, we had zero for poor. Um, now that's only, we're still only looking at 52 re re people that report comments back to us and we had 4,880 bookings. So it's quite a bit of a difference there. Our, I'll jump right into the community services. Second quarterly report for the community services. Community giving, donations, sponsorships and recognition uh, policy. We've had 28 of 32 requests approved. $9,750 in monetary donations or sponsorships. $5,600 in in-kind services and promotional items. Council givings, there was three requests, $57,730 funded. Community action grants, as of the June 15th intake, seven of nine applications were approved, $33,400 awarded. Uh, that's a total of $106,480 in community giving. Uh, last page, there was a list of all the, uh, the requestees. I won't go through the uh, full amount there. Uh, visitors information and interpretive center report. Number of visitors right now currently we're at 657 uh, visitors compared to last year's 219. Uh, out, of the, out of the 657, local are 356 people, provincial are 96 guests, national 17 and international five that have dropped in. Trading post, we're at a revenue of uh, or $1,676 compared to last year's $1,370. Our concession, uh, we're at $4,587. A lot of that is ice cream. The kids are enjoying the ice cream at Shaw House, I, I gotta say. Uh, last year, we don't have a, a number on that because we didn't open it up until the third quarter. So I, I don't have something to compare it to. Um, the meeting room rentals, we've had 12 rentals downstairs. Uh, one was external, 11 of them were internal. And that it is, that's it for both reports. Any questions? Thank you. Yeah, Councillor Fedev. Yeah, just two comments. Uh, I, I like how you deflected the ice creams to the children, not the staff. <laughs> uh, but yeah, okay, good job. Uh, so in regards to the uh, Coal Lake campground, yeah, getting, getting a lot of feedback of uh, being very positive and friends that are having their family down are just, just loving it and uh, just wanted to, you, know, you guys to know all that. Excellent. Excellent. I guess I had a couple comments. Uh, I had two people the other day approach me and ask about uh, Shelter Bay. And I know we discussed that, that'd be quite a program, but it's one of our nicer lakes in the MD. Uh, I think we should just explore that a little bit more. Um, also, someone said, uh, uh, like, Muriel Lake doesn't have a caretaker no more, I believe? Correct. And they just, uh, someone commented to me, they're, they're uh, scared to be there now with their family without a caretaker. So it's, uh, yeah, just, it's funny. Yeah. We, just a little bit of a reassurance uh, that there's a caretaker driving around uh, makes a big difference, I guess. Just so a comment. No, certainly. So for our Muriel Lake campground, we have uh, maintenance people that are, that are down there every day. Yep. Uh, the park attendant or, or the caretaker person is out of our uh, Bezel Beach uh, admin building. Uh, that being said, we are looking at next year making a few minor changes there where we will have somebody down there uh, throughout the day between 7 in the morning till 9 at night is what we're looking at. Yeah, I think caretakers are myself, my own personal... It means a lot to some people that come to a certain lake every year. It's just like the mom and dad of or, or whoever, or dad or a mom that's at that lake. I think it it does mean a lot to s certain people, right? Yeah, Any other comments? No, well, thank you so much. Thank you.
Good afternoon, Reeve and Council. Good afternoon. Second quarter, uh, the review of revenue and expenses. So as you can see, we've done a comparison with the 22, 23, 24, just to show kind of what the variance is along the boards. Um, there was, due to the operational hours creating that critical mass, um, shutting two days a week, we saw a $14,000 revenue drop. Uh, but then on the expenses side, we saw $100,000 savings. So just to be aware. And then as we go through uh, the next slide, it will show the program area. And then the following slides will dig into the program area a bit more. So as you can see with the Adventure Park, um, we've gone from 16, 19 to $22,000 annually. Summer camps, we didn't have them in 22. We have seen quite an uptick uh, this season because this is the second quarter report. It doesn't capture all the funds in there as people will register for the camp a few weeks before. Also this year, we are doing day camps um, so people could drop off their kids for the single day. And we found that to be quite successful as well. Target Golf, um, in previous years, it hadn't been opened for the second quarter. We got a operating by the second quarter of this year so you see the revenue associated there for the restaurant um, you do see there is a slight drop in revenue of uh, just over two thousand dollars but then when you look on the expenses as we go through uh, you'll see kind of how that correlates uh, with the winter revenue you'll see quite a spike in 23 that's because because of weather the hill was able to be open two additional days which saw uh, just under $40,000 of revenue. Um, so because of weather, we weren't able to have those days. So that's why there is a variance there. Going back through um, from own sources, um, you will see quite a uptick this year. That's uh, because of a secondment in the second quarter we had. So there was some revenue recognized in there. And then the totals, as you see them across the board, and then the amount of operational days in each of those years. For the Adventure Park, I know one of the big questions that was asked multiple times was about the swing. Um, working with McElhaney and Adursa, getting those uh, engineered stamp drawings, we were able to get that up and running for the beginning of the season. And then as we saw the school visits, we've gone from 352 to 614. We did reduce the cost to schools a little bit as we found that affordability to the schools, we were gonna lose numbers if we couldn't find the right price for them. Um, so it's just kind of working within that system of knowing where kind of our numbers are coming from, from there and it aligns with other aerial parks uh, of the same size of us. And of those 614 kids, um, it's close to 600 kids that got to experience the swing ride um, and then as we go to public visits, um, as we've talked about, we've seen a, a steady decrease in that number. Total visits though, with the increased school numbers, um, almost 200 more visits in that uh, second quarter. Uh, the operating expenses um, have gone down substantially and the revenue has gone up. And then as you see historically over the last three years, just breaking it down to what sort of the D looks like from a loss perspective and we've gone from almost a $2,700 day of loss down to $270. So definitely trending in the right direction. Next one is the school visits. Um, and as you can see, quite, quite a substantial difference uh, this year in the school visits. There were a couple issues on that. One was the price point. The second one was their liability insurance uh, from a naming convention of what it was called. Uh, that was cleared up um, at the end of 23, so 24, all schools had the correct liability to use the aerial park. The Ridge Restaurant, um, just going back through the operational days, you'll see how those vary in the second quarter. The revenue difference was around that $2,000, um, but the cost savings uh, was closer to almost $40,000 in there. So once again, looking at it from a business perspective, you know, with that revenue, where's that critical mass and not tipping it too far over. For programs and special events, um, we've listed them out and sort of where registration numbers were at. So summer camps, 
you can see down there is we don't have a 22 comparator as they weren't formed yet. But uh, with the Q3 of 58 um, children versus the 30 children um, coming through, it's quite a good difference and we'll show in that third quarter revenue report accordingly. Birthday packages doubled this year. Um, so if you were in on the weekends, you would see sometimes one or two birthday parties depending on the weekend. Uh, we had a couple where we had two going at the same time. Um, we did have a golf academy where we did um, teach children um, just the basics of golf. Um, so we've ran quite a few uh, students through the academy to this point. Private bookings, um, we had the, in the second quarter, we had the Smart Start Conference uh, with 55 participants. Uh, last week we did have a retirement due of 130 people um, on a Thursday evening, um, so that was quite a good revenue generating opportunity. Also for next summer, we want to really encourage uh, the weddings going on there. So uh, just working with Pure Creations, they were able to um, get some very nice decor upstairs. We were able to do a photo shoot. We had a bride that was available in a dress and uh, for marketing patch, pa packages in the future. So really gonna try to lean into that for the 25 season. Resort guests, um, so once again, you have the map in front of you just showing kind of where our people are coming from. And once again, same kind of trend. You see the 58% from Cold Lake, 27 from the MD, and 7% uh, coming from Bonneville. Um, we do have a few guests that uh, came in also from Saskatchewan, and all this information is gathered from passes and waivers, and that's how we're gathering the information for people coming through. So if you're just going to the restaurant, we're not gonna interrogate you on where you live, but um, just from the information that we gather, we, we put it into the slide. The next one is our marketing slide. Um, and then this just kind of shows views off of the Instagram website, Facebook. <coughs> and then our top pages being the Canusel Ridge homepage, um, jobs at Canusel is number two. Um, the Adventure Park, three. Winter Activities, four. And then the restaurant was five. Other marketing items that we looked at uh, during the second quarter was our radio advertisement. We had summer camp posters uh, that we were putting up at each school and uh, resource centers. We had an adventure park poster that was uh, sent to all the campgrounds and the provincial campgrounds and we did notice that we were getting more guests coming from campgrounds with posting those out there. Um, we did a summer brochure uh, where we sent out over 15,000 to various mailboxes just to see if we could get that local traction coming back in. We did two paid Facebook campaigns for events. Um, and then for each of the events that we went to, uh, we um, marked the tickets to which event it was for a discount coupon. So as keep people are coming through the restaurant or aerial park that we can identify where we're getting the people from so we know where to focus our energies, where we're going in the community as well. Um, and then as you can see the booth, um, we redesigned the tent. Um, we got some new tablecloths, some new banners, um, just to make it look a little more appealing for people coming up um, to get that engagement. And then uh, as the front slide um, shows, that, that was from the LaCorie Farm Fair. Um, so that was one of the events uh, that we did get some good traction from. For our capital projects, just for a quick update, um, Canuso Main Gate, we're looking for the certain aesthetics with that gate too, um, and functionality. So we're looking for an automated uh, gate in there with various codes so that our bonded uh, contractors that come through, whether it be septic or uh, linen companies, or food vendors, we can have them punch in. We know who's coming in and out of gates um, to make sure. We have uh, our operations crew is working uh, with a contractor just to see what other designs we can get with regards to that. The wedding venue deck um, is linked in with the phase one trails. As we know, McElhaney and Legacy Tourism did come in um, and they're proposing a lot of items that we'll see at capital budget um, as we've done our kind of wanted wish list versus the legacy tourism list and the five year financial implications to the MD. Um, so there'll be more decision points to make around that, but we just don't want to end up putting 
the wedding deck where potentially we're going to be putting another piece of infrastructure so we want to be very careful so we're not moving it twice snow gun replacement uh, we went through procurement uh, early in january uh, they've been procured we're just waiting for them to be shipped from italy Pack backup power generator the meter was moved on april 30th and uh, the generator will be shipped on site around september 24th truck replacement those went out in the truck replacement uh, tender package that went out so that has been delivered on site ac upgrades we did have um, a big line item in here after um, not getting some timely responses from our uh, future our former uh, mechanical contractor we used another mechanical contractor um, and just realized that we did have the capacity to have ac within that building um, so there are a couple sensors that we need um, to override that have been that we've been waiting uh, for shipment for about two three weeks now but once those get in we should have the capacity within the building to have the ac on so hopefully we can put that money back into the reserves uh, chair lift load decks um, so we had doppelmeyer come in and do some maintenance warranty on the lifts so we do have the supplies we do have the plan all laid out for that they just left this saturday so we will be getting those um, done here very shortly and then the last item was the phase one trail planning project once again we did have mclaney come in talk to us legacy tourism was on the screen um, just talking about the feasibility of how we're going to move forward so i think during budget deliberations uh, we'll have a good opportunity to look at those numbers um, and decide what uh, direction we are headed in. Thank you. Okay. Any questions, gentlemen? No. I yes, just go ahead. I want to say good job on all that the numbers you presented there. Uh, and thank you for uh, meeting with us when we brought Minister McIver out there with yep. the Reeve, myself, and that. Yep. And uh, what question I was brought up was about that. Uh, uh, the paving from the, the walk path. Back yeah. To there. Have we looked into that for what yeah, cost? Yeah, we have. Um, we do have um, some budget available within the Adventure Park, and we would like to try to get that done this year. Um, we are closing on the 15th for seasonality, and then after that point, we can look. Obviously, with the site selector tour coming on the 21st, we want to have the opportunity to take visitors and guests up to the lookout pier, um, so we wouldn't do it till after the 21st, and then I know weather-wise, you know, we should be good for a little bit, but we are looking into it and getting it done this year. Yeah, well, I just want to say thank you because you were a big uh, help there in the discussing the resort to with Mr. McIver, and he was very impressed with the with the the uh, facility there, and the stuff. resort, and all that. And so a lot of uh, I think a lot of good came out of that visit and the discussions. Thank you. Awesome. Well, you got a question? Yeah, uh, Councilor Fidel. Yeah, just think more of a comment. Just. Uh, Looking forward to the uh, show and shine on September 1st on Sunday. Uh, so anybody that has a somewhat of a hot car, if you don't have a hot car, just leave it at home. <laughs> but uh, show up uh, Sunday, uh, and we'll be there. For, uh, yeah. So guys with stolen show. cars come to this car show is what you're saying. <laughs> Sorry, so I interrupted. Good coffee and breakfast, five dollar special. So come early. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, thank thank you. you for getting that in, uh, Councillor Fideev. All right. Well, thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. And one more thing, just admin administration recommendation action that Council accepts the Planning and Community Services 2024 second quarterly report as information. Thank you. Just looking for a motion now, gentlemen. Yep. Thank you, Councillor Fideev, for making this motion. That council accepts planning and community services 2024 second quarterly report as information. Any discussions? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. That's carried. Thank you. On to 9.4.1. Good afternoon, Mr. Reeve and all council. Good afternoon. I'm here uh, to present the unaudited financial statements. Um, this purpose of the report is to present Council with financial results for the second quarter ending June 30th, 2024. Uh, regular quarterly financial reporting provides Council with the financial required financial information to make informed business decisions and assist in meeting Council's responsibility to the community 
as well as adhering to the CAO's legislative responsibility to inform Council. Attached for Council's review is Appendix A, Statement of Operations, which is actual versus budget comparison. Appendix B, Statement of Financial Position, Assets over Liabilities. Appendix C, Schedule of the Reserves. Each reserve is listed there with the dollar amount in each of the reserves, uh, totaling a little over $78 million. Appendix D, Investment Continuity Schedule. This includes the $78 million from all of the reserves plus a little over a million dollars uh, from our general bank account. Appendix E uh, is the Capital Project uh, Work in Progress Report, which lists all of the active projects with the approximate completion date as well as the percentage of dollars spent thus far. Uh, administration's recommendation is that Council accepts the unaudited financial statement report for the 2024 second quarter ending June 30th, 2024 as information. Thank you. Looking for- I'll yeah. make that motion. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Slipchick, for making this motion that Council accepts an uh, audited financial statements report for the 2024 second quarter ending June 30th, 2024 as information. Anybody has any discussion on this motion? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. Thank you, that's carried. On to 9.4.2. Um, thank you, Mr. Reeve and Council. Um, administration is presenting policy number 2B.010, Internet Banking Policy, to be rescinded uh, through the policy review process. It was determined that this policy um, was written as a procedure, not as a policy. So thus the policy number 2B.010 internet banking policy will, uh, it will be rescinded and the policy will be reissued as, a, as a, an internal procedure. Uh, attached is the policy for your review um, and um, this report will be posted on the MD website along with Council's agenda for August 27th. Uh, the recommendation is that Council rescinds policy number 2B.010 internet banking policy. Thank you. Just looking for a motion. Yes, thank you Deputy Reeve Crick for making this motion that Council rescinds policy number 2B.010 Zero one zero internet banking policy. Any discussion on this? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. That's carried. Thank you. On to Paul, on to nine point four point three. Um, thank you, Mr. Reeve and Council. Um, this report um, is a presenting policy number 2B.021, cash handling policy to be rescinded. So again, through the policy review process, it was determined that this policy uh, was a procedure, not a policy, and we're requesting that it be rescinded um, and reissued as, a as an internal procedure. Um, again, it'll be posted on the MD website with the agenda package. Uh, the recommendation is that Council rescinds policy number 2B.021, cash handling policy. Okay, thank you. Looking for a motion, gentlemen. I'll make the motion. Okay, thank you, Councillor Slipchick, for making this motion that Council rescinds policy number 2B. 021 cash handling policy. Any discussion on this policy? I'll call for the vote. That's carried, thank you. On to 9.4.4. Uh, thank you, Mr. Reeve and Council. Um, Alberta Municipal Affairs annually reports a performance measure that identifies the percentage of municipalities that are deemed to not face potential long-term viability challenges based on their financial and governance indicators. 
This performance indicator is used as a benchmark to ensure Albertans live in a viable municipalities and communities with responsible, collaborative, and accountable local governments. The performance measure is based on analysis of 13 municipal indicators. Each of the indicators has a defined benchmark. A municipality is deemed to not face potential long-term viability challenges if it flags one critical indicator or three or more non-critical indicators. The MD of Bonneville did not meet the threshold for one non-critical indicator for the 2023 fiscal year. This indicator relates to infrastructure age and tells us that the net book value okay. of the municipality's tangible capital assets is less than 40% of the original cost. The MD's result is 32.75%, well below the expected result of more than 40%. This means that the municipality is not replacing existing assets on a regular basis. Alberta Municipal Affairs recommends that Council considers conducting a study of municipal infrastructure to ensure that future service requirements can be met. The MD is currently implementing an asset management pro program which will essentially provide the MD with the evidence-based data and the financial capacity to move forward in addressing this issue. So attached for Council's review is the Municipal Affairs Municipal Indicators listing. Um, there, and this report again will be posted on the MD's website uh, with this agenda package. Um, the recommendation is that Council accepts the 2023 Municipal Indicators Report as presented for information. Thank you. Yeah, I'll move that we receive it as information. Thank you, Deputy Reeve Crick, for making this motion that Council accepts the 2023 Municipal Indicators Report as presented as information. Uh, any, uh, yeah, go ahead, Councillor Scarson. So is this... When, like when was this report conducted and completed? Is this just recently? So this, through the reef, um, this report was presented to us about a month ago, and it was based on the results of our audited financial statement for 2023. So um, that the municipal affairs takes the data from all of the municipalities and um, does this analysis. And it becomes part of their annual report that you'll find on Alberta's um, government website. So they so they do this each year to they, to every municipality. Exactly. Yes. And and then so how long have we had our um, asset management program going on? So um, through the Reeve, uh, I've only been here for two years. Uh, and it has, it was just sort of getting started when, when I started. So um, we're um, building that program, which will essentially provide us with what municipal affairs is um, uh, uh, advising us to do uh, and provide factual data related to our assets and allow us to target our funding um, to projects that will help address our infrastructure um, needs, uh, you know, to repair and replace and refurbish. So then, um, how does this compare to previous years? I don't remember seeing this last year. Um, through the Reeve, I don't believe a report was brought to council last year, um, and I'm not sure if if um, what municipal affairs sent out uh, prior to that. Thank you. Any other discussion? Okay, seeing none, I'll call for the vote. That's carried. Thank you. On to 9.4.5. So, thank you. This is our, uh, for corporate services, this is the uh, second quarterly report um, and assessment services is up first. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, this is the assessment services second quarterly report that includes April, May, June, and it's as of June 30th, 2024. Uh, 2024 versus 2023 property tax revenue. Uh, in 2023, uh, at this time, June 30th, uh, about $2.7 million was collected. This year, we're a little down on that. We're at 2.5, about $200,000 less. Uh, the total uh, levy for last year was about $103 million. This year, we're uh, slightly up on that, $105,672,000, about $2.6 million, uh, $2 million, $2 million increase. Uh, 2024 versus 2023 property tax properties. Uh, that's the number of properties being uh, have, that have paid this year is uh, 1,027 uh, properties. Uh, it's about 414 uh, less properties than last year that have paid at that June 30th period. Uh, last year, uh, a total of 13,785 properties were levied for property tax. This year, 13,889, about 104 more properties. This is due to growth, subdivisions, and a, a few extra oil wells, that type of thing being taxed. Uh, summary for the quarter for the property tax penalty levied. Uh, last year, uh, year to date, 2023, $162,379 was uh, in penalties levied, levied, and this year it's $146,956, and the penalties were applied as of March 1st, 2024. Uh, property tax revenue, uh, the tax notices were mailed out on May 31st, 24 this year. Uh, last year it was May 26th. Uh, property tax payment plan. This is where uh, rate payers uh, can pay monthly property taxes. Uh, and there's, uh, in 2023, there was 1,236 properties of the 5,469 residential properties. Uh, about 22% were paying on the payment plan. Uh, this year, uh, 1,248 properties out of the 5,486 residential properties uh, were paying this way, roughly the same as 22%. Um, 2024 arrears list. In 2023, there was 94 properties qualified to be placed on the tax arrears list. This year, there was 80. Um, summary for the quarter of uh, property assessment, the DIP properties. Uh, DIP stands for Designated Industrial Properties. Now there's two types of those. Uh, one is the linear, which is the pipelines, wells, and power lines. And in that category, there was no uh, material assessment revisions and no appeals. And for the other DIP category, uh, the nonlinear, the M&E, &E, and uh, that's machinery and equipment and buildings and structures. Uh, again, there was no uh, material assessment revisions or no appeals. Uh, I did notice this year in my inspections, there's a lot more rigs working in the MD. Uh, I, my count's about six or seven. So it's pretty busy out there in the old patch. Definitely. Yeah. Um, for the property assessment on the municipal side, uh, municipal role, that's the residential farmland, commercial properties. The property appeal date uh, deadline was uh, August 10th. Uh, that fell on a weekend, so that got moved to August 12th. At that time, we had no appeals, but after that, we did get one, one day after that. Now, because that's a uh, appeal outside of the deadline, the uh, lands and, land and property rights tribunal will hear that and make a decision if that appeal can move forward. This is a date issue. And the uh, municipal insurance expenses. Uh, in 2023, the total expenses were $498,307 for the entire year. Uh, to the June 30th period of this year, 
uh, end of this quarter, uh, it was $429,078. That would uh, conclude my presentation. Any questions? Thank you. Yeah. Just a lot of thank yous, I guess. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Good day. Good day. Good afternoon again. Good afternoon. I'm here to uh, present the uh, second quarter activity uh, for the finance department. So on our first slide that we have, uh, the number of invoices that we had compared from 2023 to 2024, we had 245 less invoices. However, the increase of disbursement was uh, a little $4.3 million more in disbursements for our accounts payable. Uh, utilities uh, in our customers, for our waste customers, we have 438 customers, water 297, sewer 299, Bulk water, 353. We have a total outstanding at the end of June was 25,103.59. Uh, and as you can see by the pie chart, everybody is in the current to the 31 to 60 days, which is uh, that new bylaw is working really great for our utility department. In the receivable areas, uh, we have um, the accounts receivable customers that we did invoices for included airport fees, landfill fees, security for patrols, permits, tax certificates, kinesu for groups and school billings. And uh, for our second quarter, the outstanding was $196,092.56. And again, it's mostly in the current. And we have a little bit in our 121 and over, and we are working very hard on trying to reach those customers. Some of them are, they have not left us a, a forwarding address or phone number. So we may have to have in the future um, some items to write off here. But we're trying our hardest to try to reach those customers to get payment. And that's it for the finance department. Can we have some thank yous for her? <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Next. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I just wanted to say that we did implement our online hiring tool this spring, which was a great success. Seemed like it worked really well. There was a lot of great interest. You will see in some of the slides that we have our numbers vary greatly from 2023 to 24. Active and new hires um, is very different and that is basically because we are now taking on the parks, which means that we've hired a large amount of people to tend to those. So those are why you're seeing such a fluctuation from last year to this year. In the last slide of recruitment at a glance, you will see that the positions recruited is much lower than the contracts and the orientations that we've done. And that was because we have put together a different recruiting tool, which left some of the um, interviews and such within the departments and eliminated us having to go and interview for 300 different positions. That's all I have. Thank you. Is there any questions? Thank you. <laughs> Next, Mark. Good afternoon, Council. Good afternoon. Um, I'm here today to present the IT fourth quarter report. Um, on your sheets, you can see IT help desk tickets, uh, service requests have been fairly steady over the last five quarters with a low in Q4 of 2023. Uh, it's normal due to the holiday season. IT service requests have been fairly steady over the last five quarters. Um, also, uh, we're sitting around the four-year, or sorry, five-year average of 484 tickets. Um, currently, 480 was in the last quarter, so right on that average. Uh, our ticket resolution times. Um, we're up a little bit from last report um, for the better. 48% uh, were resolved within uh, one hour and 84% within five hours. Our current security risk score is at 7.4. We're pretty happy about that. Uh, we've finally gotten below the industry score of 7.7. .7 and still working to improve that. Obviously, there's always new threats, uh, emerging security issues that we have to patch and take care of. 
our risk statistics, you'll see we've 72 uh, risks in the last 30 days, and that's 30 days from when the report was generated at the end of June. Uh, 1,673 risks were mitigated in that quarter with uh, 668 unresolved. Our security coverage score continues to be 100%, and that is basically just how engaged we are with the platform. Um, everything from our managed detection to staff training. Any questions? Yeah, uh, <coughs> Councillor Scarson. So is this, like, is this you guys doing the, or is that someone external? Uh, through the Reef, so we do the patching and the maintenance. Uh, we use third-party tools to help us collect those metrics. Sorry, I'm talking about the audio in here and the screens and all that, the upgrades. Oh, sorry. We have, uh, through the Reef, we have an external contractor working on things. Um, right now we're waiting on some back-ordered equipment. So when, when do you expect that equipment? We're hoping to be live at the latest in October. October? Yeah. So like, why did we take down these TVs and stuff until and we knew we were going to be back order until October? We had to start the project while council was on a bit of a break, um, just to get things moving. We may have the audio in place before that. Officially, the system should be fully functional. We're hoping we can actually, in the next few meetings, have the audio up and running and use the new audio system. Yeah, Councillor Fedev. <clears throat> yeah, with all the uh, new IT, I guess, hacks and security, cybersecurity stuff that's been happening out there, I was just wondering how your new program uh, has been working since I think we got a new software program last year. Did we not? Uh, through the Reef, correct. We've been with our security contractor and software program now for just over a year. Yeah. Um, we're quite happy. It's helped us... Um, just, just see the issues and uh, be able to patch them quicker. Um, we have tools in place that if something did happen, you know, a lockdown could happen in the middle of the night on our, our environment if things were compromised. So there's that 24 seven monitoring as well. Um, I think the value is there uh, after hearing about some of the other municipalities, definitely um, I sleep better at night having it. <laughs> Yeah, it's just it's just, just an ongoing thing, and seems like you can never get rid of some of the bugs that are there. And I know, uh, or like our neighboring municipality has suffered a lot because of it. And all yeah. like a lot of the service industry, mechanics, and everything else. There was a, there was a there was a massive one done there not too long ago on that, and it's just been very Correct. painful. So yeah. I'm glad we're ahead of the game. So yeah, thanks for that. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to say a little bit of a praise, I guess, because I sit on other boards and stuff, and we we farm our IT guys out here and there. We were, and everyone always talks about how great the IT is and the MD. So, just tell the rest of the guys their thanks for all they do and appreciate Thank you. it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. <clears throat> Any other questions? No. Right on. Thanks. Thanks. Good afternoon, Council. Good afternoon. And Reeve. Uh, today I am here to present the second quarter progress report for occupational health and safety. So Q2 is a really big and challenging quarter for us. We see a massive increase in staff in this year. Um, we saw our Q2 staff go from 180 to 245. And departments have to onboard train and get these folks working in a really short period of time. Um, these folks worked a total of just almost 77,000 hours for Q2. And at the beginning of Q2 in safety, we have this uneasiness because we have all these new folks that are coming on our site. Um, so looking at our lagging indicators, we are down slightly in our recordable injuries. We had four injuries, which included three modified so uh, soft tissue, sorry, modified work soft tissue injuries and a minor scrape first aid. 
So these numbers have been creeping down slightly on our lagging side for recordable injuries. For property damage, you can see we're down just slightly, um, but we did show a trend in June where we had six of the eight incidents were backing up. Um, so the subsequent investigation indicated an erosion of standards as workers were failing to follow basic controls such as using a spotter and walk arounds and there were some training issues with our new staff. Turning now to our leading indicators which are our proactive numbers that help us identify problems so we can fix them. We continue to see good numbers on this side. Uh, in 2024, we are up slightly for hazard identifications, which means we have more people acknowledging and identifying hazards in the field so we can fix them before they become a problem. Near miss reporting is staying constant with 2023. Uh, we were happy in 2023 to bring the numbers up to this, so uh, matching them in 2024 is um, a good indicator. We like to call near misses free learnings because essentially an event happened but no one got injured and it gives us an opportunity to investigate and fix the problem uh, and learn from it. For equipment and vehicle inspections, leading indicator, we are down slightly in this quarter but holding fairly steady in comparison and will likely stabilize here uh, at these numbers in our equipment and vehicle inspections. For me, one of the most important leading indicators is our hazard assessment because identifying hazards and applying the controls are a key part of the safety management system. These site-specific hazard assessments are done daily or even multiple times a day by our boots on the ground folks. Our workers have done a really great job submitting almost 1,800 hazard assessments this quarter. For worksite inspections, they've increased substantially in this quarter's number um, as it includes our campgrounds. I, I will say um, this number might be a little bit un, uh, misleading. Um, some folks were doing a inspection rather than a, a site-specific hazard assessment, which um, we got turned around for the next quarter. Um, but with this important number, we see more managers and supervisors attending sites and interacting with their staff. In addition, workers are able to take ownership over their sites by taking pride in the inspection process. Uh, the leading indicator of positive observations, you can see now that this number has ballooned. Um, you may remember in 2022, we had three. Uh, in 2022, we had three inspections. Um, in, we had 15 in all of 2023, and this year in, we have almost 60 inspect, uh, positive observations in this quarter. Um, the theory is that if you get workers to report, well, anything, uh, they will be more likely to report other things as well. So this was a clever way to get workers to start using the system and reporting peer-to-peer -peer observations. Uh, we worked hard to foster this metric and we can now see the benefits of these numbers overall in all of our reporting. Also this quarter we had our annual safety day, Safety Palooza. Uh, all of, at our all staff safety meeting we uh, had almost 200 MD employees working together on cross departmental teams through 21 stations. The stations included minute to win it games and a safety question which was taken from our audit. Uh, the Sinking Lake Spotters took top prize and it was a great safety culture team building day. And then finally, uh, just a little bit about um, the update to our business plan. Our goal, our first goal was to improve the safety culture at the MD. Uh, we targeted, we attempted to do this using increased proactive, to increase the proactive record, reporting by 5%, which we achieved in Q1 as our business plan had said. We established weekly visits to Kinnisoo Ridge and we developed alternate methods of communicating occupational health and safety messages to our internal stakeholders. And ultimately, it would leads into goal two, which was to reduce recordable incidents by at least 5%, and we are on track for that for our 2024 year. Any questions? Thank you. Yes, uh, Councillor Scarson. So would you say that um, with your recordable injuries, is that like mostly new hires? Is that what you're saying, that if we're getting hurt? Through the Reeve. Um, it's not mostly new hires. We do uh, have that. Um, across all levels of staff. So w I, I never target it just to the new hires. 
um, I guess I'm just asking in your opinion though, is that, are, is, are these like long-term employees that are still getting hurt or is it mostly, is, one demo, is it one demographic over another is what I'm asking. So based on the four injuries this quarter, no, it's not one demographic over another. And then, um, you know, for, let's say for someone that, as you mentioned, backs into something because they didn't have a spotter. So like, I guess you don't have to get specific, but is there any recourse for someone that does something like that? Through the REV, so that would depend on the circumstances. So an investigation would follow and if, if they weren't trained properly or they're new in, in the case that you're asking, then we'd have to look at our system. Did we provide enough training? If it was a long-term employee who had enough experience and knowledge and they uh, had an erosion of standards, then that would be up to the supervisor to decide if there's recourse because in the safety world, we don't do the disciplining. Mm, yeah, okay. I would just, and then lastly, I would just say as a statement that uh, goal number two should honestly be recordable incidents should be zero, not less by 5%. Like that, your goal should just be zero people getting hurt and zero property damages, don't you think? Ultimately, it would be nice if it was zero. I don't um, believe that's an achievable metric at the MD yet. All right, well. Anyone else, any other? Yeah, to be zero is pretty tough anywhere. I don't think it's that tough. I mean, no. there's lots of places, places to do it, right? Why did you say at the MD though? Is there, like, is there something different about at the MD, how we do work? in other places to achieve zero? Through the REEV, uh, we would like to achieve zero. We have a really good reporting culture, so we look at incidents from the most minor scrape to a bruise, so all of those things are pulled into our reporting, which um, in other industries may not be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to agree. Some industries, you don't report the little thing like that, but in ours, we're reporting everything. Like I skinned my thing changing a guard last night, so that would be reported. It would be. Exactly. Well, if you're comparing it to farming, yes, you're probably right. <laughs> Nothing's been reported. Yeah. Well, I'm not. It's other. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I would just like council, or I would just um, ask council to. Um, make a motion to accept the corporate services 2024 second quarterly report please yes thank you councillor Kraviak, for making this motion that council accepts the corporate service 2024 second quarterly report as information if that's okay with you <laughs> seeing no discussion i'll call for the vote That's carried. Thank you for all that. 9.5, Chief. Go ahead, 9.5.1. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. you guys, too. Hey, Steph. Hello. Hello. Uh, so first I have bylaw number 1875, Joint Assessment Review Board's bylaw. So in February of 2024, Council approved a request to establish a Joint Assessment Review Board um, in partnership with the Summer Village of Pelicaneros and also instructed administration to reach out to other neighboring municipalities to inquire on their interest in participating in the Joint Board as well. So since that time, administration did reach out to the municipalities and get feedback on which ones would like ha did have interest in participating and we have um, drafted a final version of a joint bylaw for council's consideration and we also have the final draft agreement for your reference um, the um, the bylaws for reading and the um, agreement is just for your information since february we have coordinated this initiative and um, we are presenting bylaw number 1875 for the establishment of a joint assessment review board for first reading. Each municipality will be presenting a bylaw of similar form to their council 
and as each respective municipality passes their new bylaw administration will coordinate the execution of the agreement for the joint board accordingly. So the draft bylaw is attached as Appendix A and the draft agreement is attached as Appendix B. The new bylaw will be posted on our website and updated public information will be available online once the joint board is established. And our recommended action is just that bylaw number 1875 being a bylaw of the Municipal District of Bonneville to establish joint assessment review boards with partner municipalities be given first reading. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll make the motion, uh, motion for first reading. Okay, thank you, Councillor Fideev, for making this motion that bylaw number 1875 being a bylaw of the Municipal District of Bonneville number 87 to establish joint assessment review boards with partner municipalities to be given first reading. Any discussion on this, gentlemen? I'm seeing none. Let's all call for the vote. Yep, yep. Boom, boom. That's carried, thank you. On to 9.5.2. So the next item is bylaw number 1876, um, kind of in line with the Joint Assessment Review Board. This is the bylaw to establish an intermunicipal subdivision and development appeal board. So again, this was um, shared with each partner uh, neighboring municipality that expressed interest in participating and um, this is the final drafts that we've come up with and have been provided to them as well for presentations to their council for adoption and approval. And our recommended action is that bylaw number 1876 being a bylaw of the municipality to establish an intermunicipal subdivision and development appeal board with partner municipalities be given first reading. Okay, thank you. I'll make a motion for first reading. <coughs> thank you, Councillor Slipchick, for making this motion. That bylaw, number 1876, being a bylaw of the Municipal District of Bonneville, number 87, to establish intermunicipal subdivision and development appeal board with the partnering municipalities will be given first reading. Any discussion on this, gentlemen? I'm not seeing none. I'll call for the vote. That's carried. Thank you. Thank you. 9.5.3. Um, thank you, Mr. Reeve and Council. Um, this is uh, a report is the CAO's office 2024 second quarterly report. Um, and we'll start with marketing and communications. Thank you. Good afternoon through the chair to all of Council. I'm presenting the second quarter report for marketing communications. Uh, highlights from projects this quarter include the production and mail out of the 2024 Guide to Rural Living, the 2023 annual report and 2024 budget document was completed. Our website top views through quarter two was the home page closely followed by the MD campgrounds page with camp campsite reservations opening at just over 9,500. Page views across our website totaled 94,594. Uh, MD Facebook reach was up 190.9% over last quarter, and Facebook profile visits increased by 129 or 126.9%. The top social media posts through Meta included three from National Public Works Week, mattress recycling, cost of dust control, and grain bag rolling. Additional posts with uh, top reach was the release of the MD ownership map, the Seoul or State of Local Emergency and the first fire ban back on April 25th. That concludes my overview of Q2. Thank any you. Questions? Any, any questions, gentlemen? Thanks. Good afternoon, Council. Good afternoon. I will be presenting the second quarter reports for the customer service team. During this time, uh, we had approximately 513 cash batches that we had um, worked on and sent over to the bank. We received 9,463 calls. Uh, 12,197 calls went through our automated phone system. We had approximately 915 walk-ins. We assigned 202 landfill cards. 
During this time, we assisted the property tax department with the 2024 tax notices mailouts and tax certificate search. We assisted and participated in the emergency preparedness event. We provided campground cash receiving training to the parks department. Uh, we created our customer service hub with the new building maintenance and janitorial request forms. And we completed our customer service business plan. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Hello again. Uh, so for legislative and information services, we have our council meetings, our team prepared agenda packages, and provided sec secretariat support for six regular meetings of council and two committee of the whole meetings. Uh, during this time, we also coordinated a total of 10 public hearings and delegations to council, which uh, one being a public hearing and nine delegations. Also during this quarter, one special meeting of council was scheduled, but subsequently canceled. Uh, there were three bylaws in draft and still under review by their respective departments for future consideration by council during the second quarter. Um, five bylaws which were finalized and pending either first reading or second and third reading. And five bylaws, <clears throat> excuse me, were passed and one repealed during that quarter. Um, as for policies, there were five new and 17 existing policies in draft or under review for council consideration at a future meeting with four new and two amending policies adopted and one policy rescinded. At the end of the second quarter, there was still two policies pending review by administration. Um, other items of note for our department, our records management coordinator continues to make progress with our records management program. <coughs> Work continued towards the creation of a joint assessment review board and intermunicipal subdivision and development appeal board with draft documents set, sent to each potential partner municipality for a period to review and provide feedback. In March, our department received two FOIP referrals from other organizations. This means that our organizations had that this means that the other organization had received a FOIP request from the public and their records in response to these requests um, involved the municipality. Uh, typically in that they are municipal documents that were sent to that organization. So when we receive these types of notifications we have um, a certain amount of time to review the records and provide p feedback on what we require to be redacted or withheld under the FOIP Act before the records are released to the person who made the initial request. So the two referrals we received, <clears throat> excuse me, in quarter two were from the federal government and the provincial government. Three of our team members, myself included, had the privilege of attending the 2024 intermunicipal sorry, International Institute of Municipal Clerks Conference in Calgary. So this conference welcomed attendees from all regions of Canada and the U.S. as well as several international attendees that work in similar natured municipal or government roles. It is uh, usually hosted in the U.S. so having the opportunity to attend it in Alberta was a very unique experience for us and it was really great. And lastly, we completed the creation of our digital land use bylaw registry. This included scanning of each land use bylaw and entering the metadata for each one individually. And that is it for my report. Thank you. Administration's recommendation is that Council accepts the CAO Office 2024 second quarterly report as information. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Fideev, for making this motion that Council accepts the CAO's Office 2024 second quarterly report as information. Any discussion? Yes, go ahead, Councillor Previa. Uh, thank you, Kolinsky. I think we should uh, bring this back to administration until the regular CEO comes back. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I thought you were going to say only the Reeve makes mistakes on words and you're going to say, Steph, you can't make mistakes on words like that. <laughs> That's what I thought you were going to say. Any other discussion on this? 
Nope. I'll call for the vote. That's carried. Thank you. On to correspondence and information. Um, thank you, Mr. Reed and Council. <clears throat> uh, correspondence has been attached to the agenda, items number 10.1 through 10.19, with the addition of 10.20. There's a few items that I'd like to highlight. Um, item number 10.9 is a, a proclamation request from Lakeland Center for F Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder. Um, and the proclamation is attached if uh, council wishes to <clears throat> pass a, a motion for the Reeve to, to um, give that proclamation. <laughs> Item number uh, 10. That's 10.9, yes. <clears throat> Shall I just go through the list and then we can go back? Or do sure. you want to do the yeah. one at yep. a time? 10.13 uh, is a letter from Lakeland Society for Truth and Reconciliation. Um, it's a donation request for the 2024 National Day of Truth and Reconciliation commemorative activities. They're asking for 18 hundred dollars the event is going to occur on September the 30th this year um, this was an item that was funded uh, through the donation and sponsorship program in 2023 uh, item number 10.14 is an email from Northeast Municor limited it's an invitation to a trail ride occurring September 9th and item number 10.16 is an email from Alberta Coordinated Action for Recycling Enterprises, or CARE. It's an invitation to the 2024 conference, which will occur September 11th to 13th, for Barry and a guest. Uh, and they're requesting the Reeve to um, have some opening remarks. Uh, and finally, 10.20 is um, an offer from uh, the Ron McDonald House Taste of Home Gala uh, event that will occur either um, November 1st in Calgary or November 15th in, um, in um, Edmonton. And I've lost my piece of paper, which... <coughs> Well, it's not like you don't have uh, 20,000 pieces of paper on your desk there. I mean, this is ridiculous, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I found it. I found it. Uh, so the Taste of Home Gala is um, a table of eight is $1,925. And um, so there's two separate events, one on November 1st and one on, on November 15th. The first one in Calgary, the second one in Edmonton. Okay. Would someone like to attend this gala? Or have we already spoken for a, have we already spoke for a seat or just that's, no? Um, we, we just got the email um, yesterday. Can we bring that up again next, council. next council meeting? So we have a little bit of time to think about it? Sure. Okay. Mr. Reeve, yes. um, just or, just for consideration, um, we certainly can bring it back at the next meeting, but the VIP pricing is only until sep only available until September fifth. Okay. So the uh, VIP pr pricing will not will no longer be available at our as of our next meeting, which was the only reason we decided to bring it today as an emergent item. So is this open just to council or just to staff as well, or or what are like uh, I don't know if we could fill eight. From just council. Yeah, go ahead, speak. I, I know in the past we've only taken two. The last year there was only two taken, and the year before. So, so we only took two. Before September 5th, we to take advantage of this offer. Um, Who can go here then? When is this a deal? In, End of September, no? November it's in November. First, November. In November. But the deadline is September? For the VIP pricing, the deadline is September 5th. Yeah. Um, I, 
I do know last year, I think we only purchased two tickets. Two tickets? Okay. You know, I should go. Yeah. That's six so far? Okay, I'll go. So let's take a table and we'll, we'll, we'll bring two, two along. Okay. We'll have to make a motion after your correspondence or during. Can we make a motion now? I'll make that motion for table right. six. Thank you, Councillor Kraviak, for making this motion to acquire a table of eight for the Ronald McDonald House Gala. Any discussion on that? Tell me when you have it up online because I don't have it on my screen and I don't want to go find it because I'll go off where I'm supposed to be. We can take motorbikes if that helps you. <laughs> Is it in December? Yeah, he's good. He hasn't drove his motorcycle in December. We'll find enough. Uh, so we're good. Okay, all those in fi or I'll call for the vote. That's carried, thank you. Can I back up on that? You were telling me that I'm supposed to attend something here and I'm looking over quickly. What, I'm, what am I supposed to attend here and uh, give a? 10.9. 10.9? 10.16 10 uh, no. is the CARES conference. Oh yeah, I got that, okay. Uh, but I gotta do 10.9? 10.9 is a proclamation request from Lakeland uh, for September. Center for Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder. Okay, can I do that right now? Do you, want, do you want a motion first? Yeah, let's have a motion okay, first. Yeah, I'll, I'll make a motion then that we uh, declare, make, do that declaration. There's a motion for me. Sorry, my hearing ain't. Oh, I lost my screen. Oh, we have it? Did you fill in the blanks? Oh, I like you. Very nice. Are you ready for that motion? Yes? All right, any discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. Carried. See Stephanie's way. Okay, fetal alcohol spread disorder awareness mount and international A. Sorry, FASD Day, September 2024. Whereas fetal alcohol spending disorder, FASD, is a diagnostic term that describes the range of effects that occur when an individual, individual who is parentally exposed to alcohol and whereas children and adults with FASD in Canada and around the world experience lifelong physical, mental, mental and behavioral disabilities as well as learning disabilities and whereas caregivers, family professionals and individuals living with FASD as well as others around the world will observe International FASD Awareness Month in September and day on September 9, 2024 with a minute of reflection at 9.09 a.m. Now, therefore, I, Barry Klinsky, Reeve of the MD of Bonneville, number 87, do here proclaim September 
9th, 2024 as Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder Awareness Day and September as Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder Awareness Month in the MD of Bonneville, I encourage everyone to act with compassion and understanding towards individuals who have experienced parental alcohol exposure and take both personal and professional responsibility to become a better informed about FASD and prevention strategies. Thank you. Just a little note on that. When Mike and I first started council years ago, uh, our Reeve had two kids living with him like that, and he took care of these two kids with this fetal. And uh, he did an amazing job raising these, these two young uh, children. It was his grandkids, and he raised them, uh, and they're active in our uh, society now, so I got to give him credit. It was really amazing what he did with these children, and uh, they brought them up. It was really nice. Those were his two grandchildren, right? That's yeah. correct, yeah. It was a class act by Ms. Our, Mr. Ed Rondo and his wife. Okay, uh, just need a motion to well, Could I ahead? mention a few things? Yeah, go ahead, Councilor. Yeah, um, yeah. there was a, I'll start off with 10.14, .10 the Northeast Muni Corps ride. If, um, I know it's kind of harvest season, so I, I'm not gonna be able to attend this because I gotta be uh, helping home. But I was wondering if uh, Mr. Bespalco would have some staff that would be able to go along on this ride with a quad. You guys got a side by side that <clears throat> you could send a couple staff along this trail ride, uh, Brian. This way they'll be with uh, the board members. Not they could kind of point some things out and get a better understanding of the trail. Uh, through the reef to Councilor Stepchuk, yes, it is uh, our intention that uh, myself and I believe. Uh, General Manager Yance are going to attend this uh, trail ride as well as approximately 70 kilometers of the of the ride are going to be through the municipality so uh, uh, there's going to be a bunch of discussion items that they had okay. listed in the agenda so we just want to see what's what their uh, expectations are of the MD uh, for it and I think uh, the CAO is going to attend uh, as well okay so. So yeah, well, I'll, uh, the logistics will, uh, if you're wanting to attend uh, or any counselor wants to attend, just uh, give me a call, let me know uh, who wants to attend and I'll arrange uh, some type of logistics for that. Thank you. Okay. Anything else, counselor Slipch? Yeah. yeah. Um, On 10.13, we still have time to, until next council meeting to make a, a donation for that, uh, which we did in the previous years, truth and reconciliation. I'm not familiar if there's a deadline in that request or not myself, but um, because it's not until the end of the month, I would suspect that there would still be an opportunity if council shows at that time too. Okay, I got that. Yeah, it's uh, all good. The next one is 10.8. Uh, uh, orphan wows and I read through it and I see that we got like uh, 5,000 and some What was it? Oh, five five thousand five hundred sixty four orphan wows in our area And uh, I think I'd like to see us bring up like Nick's uh, industry me because yourself you're on it and Mr. Kriviak talk to the industry players see what their plans are for these orphan wows okay. if they're like uh, how many they're looking to reclaim the year in our area because this is Concerning our area. Yep. Okay, so that was one point. And then we had a letter, 10.3, from Lachlan Bish, regards to Lakeland Forge Association. Like, is there something we need to do there, Mr. Reeve? Or? You sure it was 10.3? Yeah. Like there. You said 10.3, letter from Lachlan Bish, Olympic yeah. Lake Heifer. Lakeland Forge Association about the pasture we have in that area. Like, I don't really know what that has to do with the council That's between the Lakeland, I would think. I'm just asking for more of an understanding on this part. <clears throat> I didn't look at that one at all. 
because I, I don't know if it relates to maybe the past issue because uh, I'm on the Laura board and the Glenn Lacklebish uh, dropped out of it. So I don't know if there's some controversy going on over there or something. Then it's just another means or something. But I just wanted to bring it to your attention, Mr. Reeve. Okay, Is there something we need to do with that? Like I just, I, I just don't understand it. So. I don't I just, okay, I'll, your attention. I'll take a peek at it. Okay. And one other uh, thing is, uh, uh, we mentioned like uh, earlier about the, our policy on alcohol and the MD because with the site link coming up, yep. if we could, uh, if I can, I make a motion now to bring that forward to next council meeting so we can open it for discussion for. Well, you could just the site give, link. you could just give them direction to bring it to the next council. Okay, you don't have anything you have to make a motion. That's all we have to. Do? Okay, I think so. Could we bring that forward to the next council meeting, please? Do I need a motion for that? No. To do what now? Just a request, right? Mm -hmm. no. I'm sure. I'm do you want to bring it to the committee as a whole? Committee as a whole. Yeah, we can bring it to the committee as a whole. Oh, we can do it there. Okay, we'll do a committee a whole. Okay, and then you okay. just bring it up as the beginning of the meeting, just add it as a. Okay. Just add it in. Okay. And could you also push Yes. To the committee of the whole policy 48.008 that uh, wrote. Which one's that one? The one we discussed today. Mr. Roll Reeve, yes. um, if we could get motions for these and then it'd be clear for administration what the purpose is for bringing them back and then they can have some of that detail that you'd be looking for in the report instead of bringing it and then requesting the detail at that time. Okay. Okay. Fine. Well, I'll make, I'll Go make ahead. a motion for the, to bring to the committee meeting the alcohol policy for review prior to our site lake site link convention that's coming up on September 18th to 20th on purchasing of alcohol in the MD. I'm not aware of a policy that we have for purchasing Like what are you talking about for so that people can't buy liquor or what do you mean? No, because we got to keep, we've got, all these, we've got all these people coming out from other areas where we can't buy the liquor in the alcohol if they want cop. Don, your mic's not on. That's the expense, that's the expense uh, policy. Yeah, expense policy. Okay, did you guys understand that? Yes? Okay, so I have to make a motion too. Uh, well, we better vote on that one first. Okay, first. Sorry, I'm just pulling up the policy number super quick. All right. Can you bring that up on our screen somehow too? I don't know how to get it or where it's going to be. Can't move like you can today. 
Hey, Josh. Don't get old. <laughs> I'm pretty nimble until I try it, and then I'm not as nimble. I, I played baseball real hard that one day, and the next day, whole. Oh, that was hurt. It's like the old time game where you play once a week. Yeah. You play five games in three yeah. days. So you're up. Were you a part of that? I, well, I have in the past, but I have not really. Oh, yeah. We lost. Hmm? Lots. We lost lots. No, yeah. yeah. Okay, we have something, what's, what's it say? What's this? Uh, I don't know where to bring it up on my screen. I did, oh, there we go. Okay, thank you, Councillor Slipchick, for making this motion that council directs administration to bring back policy 2B025, reimbursing and expects claim policy to the September 17, 2024 committee of the whole meeting to review the purchase of alcohol portion. Any discussion on this motion? Yes, Councillor, uh, sorry, Deputy Reeve Crick. The site link conference is the 18th to the 21st, I believe. So even if we discuss that at the Committee of the Whole, we can't change a policy in time for the meeting because the <coughs> we don't we can't make policies at the Committee of the Whole. That's just a recommendation to Council. So that it's kind of a pointless motion. Oh, yeah, indeed. Who can have a straw vote? <laughs> oh, we got our next house meeting September 8th, right? The 10th, I believe. If all of council is okay with changing the date, we can certainly, yes. Okay, I'm okay with changing. Sure. <laughs> All right, any other discussion? Okay, I'll call for the vote. Uh, Carrie. I'd like to make a motion, Mr. Three. Yes, go ahead. I'd like to bring a, a policy 4A dash, uh, or sorry, 4A.008 to committee the whole to discuss possible review of the uh, undeveloped road allowances. Matt, you need oxygen back there? Yeah. <laughs> Expiry date over. Susan? You got your t-shirt in there. They can make a nice mess in that t-shirt. That's Cold Lake Fest, isn't it? Yeah, Rib Fest. Rib Fest, all right, thank you, Councilor Kraviak, for making a motion that Council directs administration to bring back policy 4A008, clearing of undeveloped road allowance policy to the September 17, 2024 Committee of the Whole for review. Any discussion on this, gentlemen? Is it good with the dates, Josh? Yes? It's fine by me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll call for the vote. That's carried. All right, just looking for your reports from members of council, if we have any. Do you want a motion to receive the rest of the Absolutely. information? Absolutely, yes, okay. I, I forgot that. that. I'll make a motion to receive the, uh, what are they called? Correspondence. Correspondence as information. All right, thank you, Councillor Crick, sorry, Deputy Reeve Crick, for making a motion that council accepts the following correspondence as information, one through 20. Any discussion on this, gentlemen? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. Thanks for catching that. Yes, sir. That is 
probably carried. Yes, uh, on to reports from members of council. So I had uh, the egg service board tour and just wanted to say we had a lot of people. It was a good tour, well, probably the best egg service board tour I've been on since I've been going to them, which was before I was even on council. Um, highlight was the tour of the Hutterite colony out by Malague, uh, just a, quite an incredible place really. And then they also had a tr tour of the tree nursery in Bonneville, which is kind of neat. They produce uh, over 20 million trees a year. And had this week had the <coughs> RMA, actually it was last week, I guess, RMA Zone 5 uh, zone meeting, I guess. And there was one resolution passed to go forward to RMA, and that's in regards to advocating for seniors uh, for basically more incentives for them in their homes for home care and transportation needs. So that's it for me. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, what's also on that SAG service board, I thought it was pretty good. The only thing I didn't like about it is the list of things that my wife makes me do now around the yard to make it my own play <laughs> around. So, like, uh. so yeah, back part a bit, but otherwise it was really nice to see. So um, I did attend the egg, the Bible egg uh, society meeting first one uh, they're just planning the, the fall fair I guess which is on um, September 12th I believe uh, note the four, 14th so um, it should be good it's a pretty big event they get the barbecue smoke off there as well um, and then I also did the had a BFA meeting there which um, as I look here, it looks it was uh, business as usual, not a whole bunch of report. I think they're just getting closer and closer each week to getting into the new building there. Um, they're waiting to do some IT stuff, I think, with the fiber optics, but other than that, it's pretty much ready to go, so that's about it. I don't have much reports. I went on the rural beautification tour. That was a wonderful thing to go see, uh, the Pine, uh, Pine View. Uh, the Pineview Colony, the Glenda one, that was very interesting. And I can't believe how these guys, uh, locals, fix up all their yards there. As well as the bar, we had a bar and lodge meeting uh, last week, and uh, we got high vacancy, uh, low vacancy rates there now, just about all filled up our rooms. We're waiting on three rooms in the bar and lodge to get renovated. Other than that, that's all I have to report. Thank you. Yeah, I don't have much, Mr. Reeve. Uh we went to Hing in the 30s on the 3rd. On the 10th, uh, the Reeve and I flipped pancakes in, in Glendon and had a parade. I'm amazed how kind of great pancakes the Reeve makes. And <laughs> Me too. And we had and we, <laughs> <laughs> and we had just enough candy. It was very nice. Uh, lodge meeting, uh, yes. Uh, I think this is the first time uh, since I came on, that uh, the Colding Lodge is uh, filled to capacity, which is very nice. It's going to help the uh, the uh, revenue, of course. And they did have a COVID outbreak here in the Bonnie Lodge, and I think now it's it's all good. Uh, also went yesterday to the Greater North Lodge meeting in Boyle. Oh. Uh, everything looks good. Operations look good, and I'm just one vote out of many nine there. So. <laughs> I just, <laughs> whatever. You sat and you listened. But it's a very nice meeting. Yeah, so uh, that's about all for me. All right, thank you. Um, just start off with our MD tour. Uh, there's actually people trying to give their butter, uh, what is their uh, hummingbirds away and trying to get blue jays. They're trying to get on my bus, of course. <laughs> just joking. Uh, thank Josh for doing one bus. I did the other. I thought it was a great tour. We've seen a lot. We, d we made a lot of miles. Pretty cool. I, I picked up a hitchhiker that morning uh, in the morning, and everyone didn't believe me, but he's one a world-renowned hitchhiker from Germany, and he's been traveling for 40 some years. Uh, Karina did a uh, kind of exclusive on him, and uh, yeah, he. I picked him up in the morning and put him in my son's house and took him on the tour in about uh, 25 minutes. So then he stayed for four or five days. So pretty cool. Um, did hang in the 30s. I spent two days there uh, welcoming people to hang in the 30s. It's one of our premier uh, fundraisers for cancer in our area, so it's uh, well attended again this year. 
Uh, I think the numbers are around 350,000 uh, is what I got. It could be crawling up a lit little bit from there. Uh, went to Glendon to flip pancakes and don't believe what Mike says. Mike is the premier pancake maker in Glendon. Uh, when you go over to his stove, every stinking, don't know how he does it, but every stinking pancake is, looks like someone, it's like someone took a picture and put it there. And uh, so, and uh, I tried and then when I, I had to leave to go to the Cherry Grove uh, opening, groundbreaking for the church and uh, my hitchhiker took over for me. So he was, uh, he was uh, working with Mr. Wurstrick on the other uh, on the other grill, so I don't know how the how the pancakes were after that, but I think pretty good. Yeah, and then he got lost, and so I took him to the parade. Yeah, he went and he was throwing candies for you. Yep. And then uh, he says, "I'm okay, Mike, but this lady was texting me. I don't know who she was. Yeah. Like, where is he? What does he look like? Yeah. So I. We eventually got him to the Derby, and he loved that. He never what he couldn't believe here in uh, North America that we smashed smash cars <laughs> so <laughs> he said this this would really catch on in europe he said <laughs> pretty good so uh uh so did that went like i said i went to the cherry grove uh, groundbreaking for the church i got to spoke there uh, Councillor fideev and myself was there there was a lot of attendance uh, looks like a uh, uh you know the a lot of people that attended that uh went to glendon derby saw some cars get smashed another crazy thing that happened to me this week is uh uh, a lady from the from Philadelphia phoned me. She said she seen me on a broadcast in um, Vietnam, believe it or not, uh, on the BBC when I was in Haiti. She was born in Haiti, but her grandfather was one of the founding people that was in this area. So when just before Bonneville started, he was here. Uh, from France, and uh, I, I don't know. We don't know if he was here for two years or three years or one year. But uh, he was well known enough that he named the two lakes just outside of Bonneville, Barrier Lake. It's not pronounced Barrier Lake in French, it's different. And then her, his wife's name was Charlotte. So that's how these two uh, lakes got their names, uh, a man that came from France. And uh, if we do get that trail eventually, we can call it the Bar uh, Barrier Lake Trail. <laughs> so I could invite them back. But they came all the way from the States to see, uh, see us. and. Uh, I took him around and I f uh, finally from Charlotte Farms, and that was, I didn't think of that before, but Charlotte Farms wouldn't be called Charlotte Farms without the Charlotte Lake. And I took him to see uh, Mrs. Gamash and she remembers her husband telling her a story that his father told him a story that he remembers the man that was here from France that named the two lakes in the early 19, like 1904, 1905. So pretty cool to find a, a lady in our area that remembers a story about. So yeah, so that was pretty, I spent the day with him. I told him if they came out for the day, I would. And uh, thank you to the MD. Thank you for the town of Bonneville. They took him in here. They showed him around and uh, I had MD staff here in the little room trying to find the oldest maps we had to try to. So I'm very thankful for everyone that put an effort into. Uh, f and then I got landowners involved and elderly people that, uh, so it was pretty cool, so. Thank you, that's all I have. All right, I need a motion to go in camera, I believe. Yes, closed session, sorry. Thank you, Councillor Slipchick makes the motion to go closed session or in camera. Yeah, two minutes. So uh, Peter Waiter's quarters, he bought two on the north side of Charlotte Lake. One of them was, one of them is where her grandfather came here. And he came from like a villa in France with a winery. And he brought his wife and three kids here and in a log cabin. It's crazy, eh? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Good job today.